and we'll we'll chat a bit with the with the group here. You know, um, you and I have been at this for many years in the industry, and and we've seen you know change after change, and you know you've been such a, a part of it, and you know you look at it, you know from your days back at Deck Alpha to you know even at AMD on the hammer designs and uh, startups and Apple. You know, you've been making you know a lot of change in the industry. Jim, tell us a little bit about AMD. Um, you know, you've been here over two years. What 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 drove you to come back to AMD, and what what were your thoughts? Uh, that's a funny way of putting it. What drove me to come here? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I joined AMD because I love processor design and I love complicated system design, and AMD was looking at taking a big swing uh, on the next generation. Um, there's definitely been some. Some problems, and issues over the years. We have some great products. You know, I love the fact that we're in the consoles. We're in really power-efficient processors all over the place. But we were looking at taking a big step forward. So, working with some great people, leading a big team, and doing something new was kind of the challenge for me. Um, and it's been really fun. It's been almost two years, and we've delivered a number of products already. And we're looking in the next two years of doing some really new big things. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you're running a big team, and I know we, we, we talked about that when, when we recruited Jim to run the, the cores team. Uh, we said, look, we're not going to create two different teams, one doing ARM and one x86. I said, Jim, can you run the team that, that does both, right, that brings us together? And I get asked the question a lot, Jim, mm -hmm. uh, how do you guys, how can you do this? You know, you're adding ARM into the mix. You know, doesn't this blow out your, your uh, development expense? What, how do you, you know, how have you gone about yeah. this? So one obvious way to do it is have two different teams, double your effort, or cut the energy you put on one thing in half. And that obviously isn't the right way to do it. So mm -hmm. um, it turns out high performance computing is mostly about high performance features, verification, methodology, CAD, all kinds of things. Those things are all common. Uh, the instruction set actually is important. Um, so the ARM ecosystem, the ARM architecture is, is very new. It has some inherent efficiencies in it, which we think is really cool. But in terms of the overall effort, you know, we get so much leverage out of stuff that it, it's not just a double effort. And interestingly enough, going through the process of designing ARM has given us a whole bunch of new ideas, which I think actually drives better core design going forward. The other thing is, we've talked about today, you know, a lot of people have tried to do completely new thing, boil the ocean, and they screw it all up. And you know we have a step-by-step -step plan. Seattle is a software infrastructure play to get that working. Mm -hmm. In 15, we build SOCs that are ambidextrous, so we've got the plumbing right, fabric memory controller, I/O system. We also brought up a whole verification infrastructure for ARM on ARM's processor. And my guys, I got to tell you, they were all excited when they thought they found a bug in the ARM processor with our tools. Turns out it was a bug in our tool, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm still waiting for that email, Simon. I'll shoot it to you. We'll, <laughs> we'll get that done. So we brought up an ARM verification infrastructure that was really good to apply to our next generation core. So as we do a new processor, it's not our first time doing high performance or 64 bits. And actually, we've already been working on ARM tools for quite, quite a while. So we're, we're making good progress on that. Excellent. You mentioned those <laughs> ARM tools. Uh, you know, and you heard me talk earlier about that ARM ecosystem. You know what? What are your thoughts? I mean, you you've you've got deep experience at both. You know, do you see do you see some advantages that you're leveraging with this ARM ecosystem? Um, well, the big fundamental thing is the ARM V8 architecture is actually quite good. Mm -hmm. uh, it has more registers. It has a proper three instruction set, or three operand instruction set. Uh, the amount <clears throat> we kind of think of it as we put spend less work in transistors on in decoding instructions and in, and dealing with the complexity of x86 and more transistors on performance. Yeah. So that's a pretty straightforward proposition. That gives us more performance, and we can also turn more performance into better efficiency. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's pretty cool. And, and what about power? I mean, do you, as you, you, know, you look, you started with a tuning, A57, and then you've got the from scratch uh, design that we call K12. Um, you know, how, how has that worked in terms of uh, leveraging ARM and, and your own uh, designer's expertise to optimize power? Yeah, so it's interesting. So AMD has two families of processors today. You know, the bulldozer family focused on really high frequency. Jaguar family, super small cores. You know, in our new generation, you know, what I told my team is we got to take the DNA of both, the best of both, and put it, put it there. So 
this is really nice. We know how to do high frequency design. We know how to do dense design. ARM gives us some inherent architectural efficiency and the combination is pretty good. You know, it's probably a, a perfect lead in for my next question and that is, you know, given that, what's your sense of our differentiation? We all know there's lots of players out there. Um, you know, uh, there, there are other licensees of the ARM architecture. What makes you confident? Um, so we have the world's best graphics. You know, that's great, mm -hmm. right? We know how to do high frequency designs. We know how to do power efficient designs. Uh, where we see adding on to the ARM infrastructure is, or ecosystem is, we've done servers, we've done scalability, we've done high frequency. We can extend the range at ARM's end. That's a nice play for us. Excellent. So I got I to ask uh, one more thing at you because it's something I'm enthused. I, I get a chance to walk, walk the halls and uh, talk to your team working on uh, K-12. I mentioned earlier, what's the sense of, you know, of your team you know, working on K-12? We've got you know, deep expertise in XA6. We continue to, you know, to not let the foot off the gas in XA6, and yet there's this whole new arm in our offering here. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's the, uh, you know, what's the, the thought of your team? What's the, what's the excitement? Well, I have to say, my team was a little daunted. We're going to do a new from scratch x86 core. Mm -hmm. We're going to do an ARM core. We're going to build a new methodology, right? So there's a lot of clean pieces of paper in that plan. So my ask to the team was, let's go design the best possible thing. That's the important thing. Great product. We did the high level design as a clean piece of paper. And it turns out we have all this technology already. We know how to use dense metal stacks. We know how to build lots of components. And we brought that in. We filled in the plan pretty fast. So the engineers are excited to be doing something new. If you want to do processor design today, you should work at AMD because we're doing real new things. But we're not starting from scratch. Like we have a lot of components there. So we make progress pretty fast. It's like a supercharged new design plan because since we're taking off the shelf stuff and ideas we worked out, that's really fun. On ARM in particular, we had to go from scratch because we didn't have any traces, performance models, ISO model. So we worked with ARM. They have a really good instruction set simulator. We quickly built Linux and ran traces. We started building workloads. On x86, we have tens of thousands of traces on all kinds of benchmarks. On ARM, we start from scratch. But you know what? The, it's kind of fun to have that kind of piece, that kind of play to go on. So people got pretty excited about it. And then it turns out, learning about ARM, we leveraged in x86, and yeah, we're making a lot of progress. That's excellent. That's excellent. Look, Jim, thanks very much. And uh, why don't you join me back on stage in uh, just a few minutes, and we'll have uh, some Q&A later. But okay. we'll uh, conclude this piece. Thanks very much. Great. Next question. Hi, Kevin Crewell from Interiors Research. Hi, Kevin. Uh, follow on to uh, uh, Nathan's uh, uh, question on Skybridge. Is would you say Skybridge is going to be a family of products that have pin compatibility x86 ARM, or how do you uh, how would you call the Skybridge uh, family, Lisa? Yeah, maybe let me start, and then I'm sure Mark can add to it. So we look at Skybridge really as a design framework for um, interchanging our ARM and x86 complexes and SOCs. Mm -hmm. um, in the um, implementation that we talked about, uh, we drove pin compatibility because that forced a certain way of thinking. Um, for our engineering teams and what we were trying to do. But it really is a broad framework for how we um, are able to kind of reuse our IP and really help the customer reuse their IP across ARM and x86. Maybe, Mark, you want to comment? Sure, I'll add on. Uh, so, Kevin, you know, that, that what Lisa described is, I'll say, absolutely a, a critical stage one of what we're doing. Uh, but it is a framework, and so it sets the stage for uh, even further optimized ambidextrous design. And that's where it comes into play some of uh, my description of a network on chip and the kind of flexibility uh, that we put in across our design system uh, to allow us to be very flexible on uh, ARM and x86 and how we marry that with the rest of our IP and then, in fact, how we configure tailored SLCs for the segments that we play in and with some of my customers. Yeah, and Kevin, one of the things that was really important about uh, many of the questions we got as we took out that 30% of the cost structure about a year and a half ago during the restructure, we talked about how could we do that and introduce the solutions. And I think, Jim, maybe you could add a comment or two about how your design teams have really worked across these two architectures. I mean, you mm -hmm. touched on it in the Q&A with Mark, okay. but this was a big deal. Yeah, so just be clear. So in 15, we have a pin compatible part. And then inside, you know, my team did the processor development for both hardening the A57 and the Puma Plus core. 
And by the way, they didn't look anything like each other when we started, but we said, we want to make one SOC, there's one place to put the core, there's one box, it's got to be the same size and shape, plus or minus. So we did a bunch of work to go reconfigure the core to be able to put either core in the same SOC. Now we have an existing fabric that supports the AAPU family that we currently ship, and it turns out Skyros and that fabric are cousins in terms of some semantics on how it works. So we upgraded the fabric to be able to support either ARM or x86 in the same fabric. Did the work in the I.O. system, the I.O. and MMU, a whole bunch of dirty details to get that right. So that's in 15. The next generation, we have a next generation fabric that spans APUs to servers, and we put a lot more features in there to make that scalability work across ARM and x86. Mm -hmm. And our new cores fundamentally started out with that target in mind. So that makes it easier to make them look the same way. So the, the charm of the plan is we got the software right, we got the SOC right, we got the fabric right, and now we're doing new cores that kind of plug. So it's compatible at the outside at the pin level. It's very compatible actually on the inside at the, at the SOC interconnect level. And then going forward, do you think you're still mixing uh, standard A57 cores and the, the K12 core after 2016? Sure. Or they're, is it they're all differentiated in size, performance, and power, yeah. and they're both beautiful parts. And you know, one will target the higher end, one will target you know, the, the, the other end of the marketplace. Okay, thanks. Jim, please. Hi, Bob O'Donnell, Technalysis Research. Uh, Jim, I'm, I want to follow up on a comment you made uh, when you were talking about designing both for ARM and x86 at the same time, that it gave you some new ideas. Now, maybe too early, to, but can you give us a sense of what kind of new ideas could you potentially bring to x86 from having done ARM? Yeah, so let me, let me say, so I have a really good team. And the architects, the implementers, verification team, they're all really strong and they're really experienced. So whenever we go and say, let's go make a faster design, you know, you know, we know how to do that. And it takes partly it's planning, you have to have the right time horizon, so you have time to actually think hard, get the work done. And then as you do the design, you know, I, I, I say architecture is a journey, right? We need to know where we're going, faster and faster computers, more efficient computers, that's all important. And as we build things, we take our best ideas, we put them down, we learn a lot. And you know, sometimes the problem is bottlenecks, sometimes you know, the capacity of some structure. So as we go through all that, you, know, you get more ideas for the next generation. Uh, the way we built the ARM processor was a little bit different from the x86. We built a bigger engine. Um, it has some interesting features, and, and thinking about that is giving us some ideas for the next generation. So, you know, I don't want to be too specific yet. In the next year or so, we'll be talking about product details. But it's partly about this is an intellectual journey. It clearly is, right? So doing the design is hard. Putting your best ideas down is what you have to do. You'll learn a lot from that. Every architect in the world kicks themselves for the last thing they did because, you know, all that stuff that looks so good on paper just, you know, you know, it was good, it's bad. You figure out a lot of stuff and you go do the next thing. So. Making different choices gives you ideas. You get different experiments, and then we go forward from there. Just as a follow-up, then on the graphics side, can you are there any issues with using the same graphics core for both ARM and x86 in Skybridge, for example, or any challenges associated with that? <clears throat> well, so graphics really talks to memory, right? So what graphics need is a really high bandwidth memory system. The old kind of graphics was graphics had its high bandwidth memory system, and it had its own memory system, right? And then for the CPU and the GPU to talk to each other, use PCI Express. You know, you had a driver model that wrote registers or wrote into the other guy's memory. With HSA, we made a, a memory architecture where they share the memory. This is a great thing. So graphics sees memory, CPU sees memory. We can pass pointers between the two of them. We have a common address space. So we developed that independent of ARM in x86. So now we say, well, we have this graphics system that understands common unified memory. That works really good. The processor architecture, Armor x86, they talk to memory. We know exactly how to do that. The interesting thing about the software, it, it's, it's where the changes that are in the software, right? We don't want to build two software stacks, one for ARM and one for x86. So the software architects are figuring out all the common driver elements that are sort of ISA independent and then only optimize the stuff that's very specific to ARM or x86. So the plan sort of fit in with HSA. We had that plan before the ARM plan, 
But then when we got to ARM, you know, one of the goals of HSA is to be a little more de independent of some of the hardware details. And so far, that's working out just great. Great. Thank you.